sometimes things just really bug me. You know, they just seem to get to me. Kind of like, you know, one of those, it's stuck in your craw, so to speak. Well, for me, the things that get to me really aren't all that bad, I guess, because I always have the answer to what the issue is. I always have the solution to what the problem might be. I usually have the scripture and the background and the historical significance of where it came from, how it migrated or how mitigating circumstances progressed through church history to cause people today to come up with these weird solutions to what they think is the right answer. And I understand how having religion as opposed to relationship, you know, or sometimes having a little bit of both but not enough of each, can really mess up somebody's theology. But sometimes, you know, I get really ticked when I'm sitting in the bathtub, you know, taking a nice hot bath, and God says, Michael. And I'm kind of like one of those Noah kind of people. No, I mean like, you know, Bill Cosby and Noah. Remember that, you know, old record that Bill Cosby made that, you know, was kind of a satire, but probably was more real than he realized? Where God's speaking to Noah and Bill Cosby does a comedy routine about it. God calls down and says, Noah. You always hear this, ding, Noah. And Noah goes, you rang? And he goes, ding, Noah. And he says, yes, it's the Lord, Noah. And you hear this pause real long in typical Bill Cosby style. He says, am I on candy camera? <laughs> well, for me, whenever I have one of those like things that are bugging me for years, you know, things that are in my mind for you know a long period of time that I'm kind of like bugged about or thinking about or talking to God about. Usually it's talking to God about because it doesn't always answer right away. You know, me, I get a little upset about that, but it takes time for me to kind of like, you know, get through all of what he's trying to teach me and tell me before I really have a handle on what he wants me to say. So I've been dealing with this subject matter, you know, and kind of like really upset about it. Finally, the other day, I I knew that, you know, God had already told me three times <laughs> to record a video about it, a video, you know. Michael, I want you to tell people this, you know. I'm like, uh-uh, not me, man. Anybody else, you go kick them. You know, go go, go grab Chuck Missler. I mean, he's not doing anything lately, you know. Go tell him to, to talk about this subject, you know. And I was like, you know, he's always into wacko stuff, you know. And God says, exactly. <laughs> so I say, well, well, then fine. Go pick, like, you know, some some critical thinker of all the theological people, you know, and they're always trying to make something new, you know, come up because they have all the THDs and PhDs and all the degrees behind them, and they, they strain at a word and struggle at a, at a theological idea and concept, and they use some you know, weird way of coming up with it that nobody ever would have thought of except for you had to go to school in order to learn all this stuff because you never would have thought of it on your own? And God says, exactly. I said, but yeah, but I'm just stupid. And he goes, exactly. <laughs> so he picked me. <laughs> and unfortunately, I'm really not that stupid. You see, my mind is very intellectual. It's very logical very precise that once you give me the certain foundation facts, you know, then like a dog at a bone, I'll nod until I get the answer. You know, I don't feel satisfied until, quite frankly, if this Christianity stuff is real and God is real himself, then I want to know the truth about everything and whatever I'm upset about, by golly, I'm hanging on to it until I get the answer. And so, unfortunately, I didn't know that when I first started this kind of like, you know, relationship with God that him and I were going to like deal with each other one on one and I was going to get these answers, you know, that a lot of people didn't either care about, didn't want to know, or they were satisfied when some pastor gave them some platitude that just sounded so phony to me that it was like, oh sure, that sounds like a used car salesman telling you that, yeah, the car's brand new, <laughs> really, uh -huh. it's only got 10,000 miles, uh-huh, sure, sure. You know, and then you find out when you drive it home, wow, what a living. <laughs> uh, a lot more than 10,000, they drove the car backwards. 
Okay, 10,000 forward, 20,000 backwards. Of course, nowadays you can't do that. Right. But the point being is that when I was younger, I always wanted to know, and I blame it on Chuck Smith because he kind of messed me up, you know. It was like Chuck was up teaching one time and he said something about, well, you know, the, the commentaries say this and the, the, the church history says this, but in my opinion, this is what I think. You know, and then he'd go on to something, you know, that kind of sounded good. And then one time he said, quite frankly, that really kind of bugged me about something that I was really interested in. He said, well, the commentaries say this, and the church history says this, but he says the Bible really doesn't make it clear. So what God doesn't make clear, we don't know. He says, so I have no opinion. I don't know. And while I admired the fact that Chuck Smith could admit that he didn't know something, I was mad ticked off. Of course, I was in my 20s, but, you know, that's typical. <laughs> Most 20-year-olds think they know it all. But I was mad because I really wanted to know. So, rather than just be content with the fact that here was this Bible teacher telling me he didn't know, and that, you know, commentaries weren't very clear on it, and, you know, church history is kind of like vague, you know, and there wasn't really a lot of specifics, you know, as far as he had studied. You know, I was upset about that, so I decided to do my own research. You know, and this was before Google. <laughs> Boy, can I tell you, Google is so wonderful. You know, it's like you can get into all kinds of things. Of course, a lot of people have a hard time knowing what's accurate using Google, but, you know, you can get into all kinds of things. But if you're a research person, if you are mindful of certain parameters of fallacy and fact and able to put paradigms in and didactic logic together and examine things with the Spirit of God. Google's wonderful. Man, it can take you all kinds of places that, you know, you can learn all about, you know, the scriptures as well as much about your faith and much about the history of how people have come to certain conclusions. But you still really, bottom line, just have to talk to God about it because, frankly, God said, my thoughts aren't your thoughts. And you kind of go, well, yeah, okay, that makes sense. You're God. You created me. So, of course, your thoughts aren't my thoughts. And he says, neither are your ways my ways. And it's kind of like, oh, well, what ways are you talking about there? And it's kind of like, always. <laughs> so, really, when you come up to a conclusion on something that you think you have really down set when it comes to God, you probably only got a piece of the puzzle and not the full picture because the full picture will always be bigger than what you realize. So, I discovered early in my walk with God and talking to Him and arguing vehemently, very angrily at first, you know, now it's more casual, but, you know, arguing with God about some subjects, you know, I'd say, well, you know, I don't, I don't buy that, you know, I want to know this, and, you know, blah, blah, blah. and I would go into it, you know, and Sometimes I'd get a direct answer immediately. Sometimes it would take years to experience, and then I'd be better able to receive the answer. God would say, now, you ready to listen? <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> but the point being, I began to comprehend more than what I could have comprehended when I was younger. So we run into a subject now that hopefully is going to give you some comprehension. Hopefully it's going to open your understanding in a better way than some of the stupid things that pastors say in order to make you feel better about a subject that no one wants to talk about. Believe me, I'm the first person who says, God, I do not want to talk about this. And yet, just recently, the reason why the third time came up was because, quite frankly, Greg Glory, you know, on his devotional, mentioned some letter that a woman wrote in and says, Oh, Greg, you know, and she was talking about some baby that was born and, you know, raised for maybe a year or two, I don't know, but how the baby had died. You know, and she wanted to know how she would recognize the baby in heaven, full grown. And I read part of that and I started screaming, What in the world are you talking about? And then when I read Greg's response, I went, where in the world are you coming from? You know, now, great glory, God bless him, he's a man of God. Just like we're all men of God. You know, we're, if we're men, I mean, if we're women, of course, we're women of God. 
that is if God is in us and God is with us and we have determined to ask God to come into our lives through Jesus Christ and that Jesus is in us because 1 John says if we have the Son we have life if we have not the Son of God we have not life so you kind of got to be born again first of all to kind of get the you know even playing field so that we're all men and women of God being that we're men and women of God and born of the Spirit that means that we have no need that any man teach you but the Spirit of God that dwells within you he will lead you into all truth and he will cause you to remember whatsoever things I have taught you Jesus said so we were given the Spirit of God to lead us into truth to guide us to explain things to us to teach us because he's God so, whenever we have a doubt about a person teaching something, they may be going through a learning process or a learning curve, or they may be sticking their foot in their mouth, you know, and it may be just one of those swallow it whole things, you know, because maybe that's what they were taught, and you just accept that. You see, whenever I went into different churches at different times in my life, I had to accept whatever church I was going into the fact that in their church they may be holding to a certain small sect or box aspect of their own faith that they operate pretty good in. You know, you do the little crank, doo -doo 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 -doo, pop goes the weasel. You know, and everything appears right on time, you know, and everything works out just the way it's supposed to. As long as you're cranking the crank and you're in that box and the weasel comes popping out. Well, then you go to another church and they don't do the weasel, you know, they do, you know, something else like, I don't know, hot air, you know, like blowing up loose. So they huff and they puff and they get all wound up and then they, they let the balloon go and sure enough everybody's running around and doing like a balloon with its, you know, not tied, just, you know, well, okay, that's their thing. So you kind of accept that they're like balloons, you know, and so you don't put the balloon in the weasel and you don't put the weasel in the balloon. You kind of get the picture? Well. I learned that in the body of Christ, everybody's learning at a different pace and a different perspective. And Greg Laurie, God bless him, you know, is probably the most dynamic, you know, evangelist, one of them, you know, that we have in modern days. You know, Rick Warren's another one. There's a lot of evangelists out there that are very dynamic, you know. Um, I grew up in a time where there were lots of very, very dynamic evangelists, so to speak, and very confrontational ones like Keith Green and other people. But my point being is that I have this tendency of going back to God immediately with whatever somebody's saying to find out what the truth is because I want to know because I was always taught that you could know the truth and the truth would set you free and to me the truth was what's the truth of every situation the Christian should be able to have the answer because Jesus said bluntly in the Word of God if any man lack wisdom wisdom is the application of knowledge if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who abradeth not, but giveth to all men liberally. You see, like I said, it may have taken me some bumbling and stumbling and beating my head against the wall for a while to get some of my basic principles down, but once I had them, man, did it spare me having to go to Bible college to get all screwed up, or Bible theology school, or anywhere else. Because my framework was directed by the Scripture, by the Spirit of God, and by those men and women of God that I learned from their experiences, as well as their lives, as well as their teachings. And so, while I appreciate their perspectives, sometimes I see some of them as limited because they don't go to God. If I want wisdom, we're told quite bluntly again in the scripture, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God who braideth not but giveth to him liberally. I always wanted the shortcut. So rather than go the long way round, you know, through theology school and commentary and pulpit commentary and then that denomination and this denomination and that non-denom and then that spirit filled and then that Bible teaching and then you know all of them and compare them all and you know work it all out in some kind of you know gestalt way of trying to assimilate all that documentation I said well God you said it you gonna do it and he did so unfortunately Jesus also said to whom much is given much is required so I'm stuck. You know, here I got the right wisdom because I asked God, took the shortcut because I asked God, resisted doing what he told me to do for about three times, and now God wants me to answer the question. Do all babies go to heaven? Well, no. Let's be clear. Let's cut through all the all the, you know, scriptures and everything else just to make the base statement so that you can kind of like shut off this video now and run away and hide and act like you never heard the truth. 
you know, or listen to the rest of it, find out that there's good news about what I'm about to say as far as what you think is the bad news. So let's get the bad news out of the way first. There is absolutely no scripture that tells you all babies go to heaven. None. None whatsoever. As a matter of fact, the opposite is true. There isn't one scripture that tells you that all babies go to heaven, but there is a scripture that tells you that God can take anyone to heaven whenever he wants to, at any point in time. He can choose to save anyone, irregardless of our ideas of salvation. Because God extending his grace is by way of God extending his grace. Grace is given by his ability to give it, not by our forcing it upon the world through you know Jesus Christ and the redemption and all that stuff that's going on because we could say that you know there's no other way of salvation which is technically true there is only one way to be saved and that's through Jesus Christ and through the cross and through the redemption that he purchased for us through the blood that was shed on the cross so that grace would be extended to us you get it without him having done it grace couldn't come to us but now that God has done it grace is extended to us but could be not extended to us. So forget about that part for a minute. Let's get back to the baseline. No, not all babies go to heaven. No, not all babies in the past went to heaven, and no, not all babies in the future go to heaven. You see, one of the quotes that Greg Laurie used is a very popular theological quote that David says, and he quotes it you know, in Scripture, and it's used way out of proportion of what he meant, but we'll quote it anyways. And it says simply that, David, and you, you can read on your own, Google it. David says, I know when his baby died. I know that I shall go to see him and I will be with him. Well, you know, okay. So David's going to see his baby that was dead, you know, that died because God caused that baby to die because of the consequences of David's sin that he caused Bathsheba's husband to die. So if you know the story, you already know why David had you know illegitimate child that was born by way of technically um, uh, screwing around with another man's wife, if you want to put it that way, so that way you understand where we're coming from. And that David caused that man to be dead, to be killed, and then thousands of Israelis died also, or Jewish people, children of Israel, died also because of the consequences of David's action. Because God gave him the option. God said through the prophet Nathan to... Give David these options of what do you want to do? You know, do you want to, do you want to suffer this and be defeated, or do you want to suffer this? You know, and blah blah blah. So David chose the, the other, and because of all that, likewise, one of the immediate consequences was David's illegitimate son that he had with Bathsheba died, and then he had mourned beforehand and afterwards didn't cry at all. And it says, well, why didn't you cry? Well, because I know that I shall see him. Well, that is the only point, the only scripture that every single pastor in the universe uses to try to prove that there is salvation for babies, you know, that didn't have a chance to ask Jesus into their life, make this full profession of faith in front of thousands of people by going to a concert or, you know, whatever may be your salvation experience, and that somehow that is the foundation for salvation that we're going to rest our case upon. Not. <laughs> I'm sorry. But maybe you've got your emotions caught up because you loved your baby, you know, and God bless you. But, you know, I have a problem here. It's called the Bible. I have another problem. It's called God. If I put the Bible and God together, I have to deal with both. And the reality is, is that God loves me more than that to, quite frankly, put into perspective the fact that David's baby born in sin and conceived in sin and all that stuff was going to go to heaven and then some other kid that, you know, we would say gets to go to heaven irregardless of their actions because they don't have to accept Jesus and they could just, frank, frankly, be slaughtered, killed today. They could be aborted and go to heaven. Think about what you're saying. If that were true, if we could say that David would see his child in heaven, then mothers would be out killing their children in order for them to go to heaven because they don't want to see them living in hell on earth. Oh, no mother would do that? Susan Smith did that, and she's in Texas now, suffering 
the consequences of her actions because she drowned her babies. Because she, quite frankly, in the court case, as you can look up in the documentation, said, my life was so bad and it wasn't going to get any better that I knew that if I killed my babies, they would go to heaven and be with Jesus and that they wouldn't have to live the life that I've lived and how miserable this life is. So she was examined by psychologists. She was, quite frankly, re-examined by pastors and psychologists and everybody in the court. And she believed it because she was told it. She was, quite frankly, legitimately thinking that she could do that. And quite frankly, she was locked up for it, too, because it was one of the most stupid things I've ever heard of. Oh, wait a minute. Susan Smith doing that is stupid, but David saying it is right. No. You see, there is an answer to that. First of all, the scripture. There's an answer also to aborted babies and babies, and we'll get to that. This won't be a short video, obviously, but we'll get to that. Bear with me. And you'll be happy about the answer. You should be, because God loves you. Now, let's be clear. David said he would see his child. That's obvious. So David was going to see his child. Prior to Jesus dying on the cross, we know if you've studied the Bible, you know, if you're any kind of Bible scholar student, you know that you've studied the Bible for a while, we know that before Jesus died on the cross, before he went to Sheol, the grave, we know that there was in the grave or the pit or the hell two places, one a paradise and one a torment. And that those who died looking forward to Jesus coming were kept in paradise. They were kept in the grave, a place of like a holding tank, so to speak. That's kind of where the Catholics get this idea of purgatory, sort of. God knows where they get everything else from. But anyways, God bless them. But the point being is that those that God had already determined that they were being held for judgment were already cast into torment. And Jesus gave that parable of the rich man and Lazarus. He said, look, there was the rich man and there was Lazarus. And while the rich man was on earth, he had all the wonderful things in in on earth that he could possibly enjoy and the rich man looked at Lazarus and you know just didn't like him you know and Lazarus just was so poor that you know he would have been happy just to lick the rich man's feet you know and so when Lazarus died and the rich man died the rich man went to hell and Lazarus went to Abraham's bosom well Abraham's bosom is technically where all those looking forward to Jesus coming and declaring the gospel to them were being held until that time of making a choice to acknowledge or to accept Jesus as the Messiah, as the one that was coming to bring salvation. And everyone knew that there would be a salvation brought by God to the children of Israel. So those that looked forward to that were always kept, when they died, in the grave, which was not the place of torment, but Abraham's bosom. Those that were evil and had done evil in this life were immediately cast into hell and torment. Just like Jesus said in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. But here's the interesting thing. When Jesus died, he spent three days and three nights in the belly of the earth, as he prophesied he would. Just like Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, the Son of Man must go into the earth, so to speak, and be there three days and three nights. And we're told later in the New Testament that Jesus went in and preached liberty by Paul, preached liberty to those that were held captive there, preached the gospel to those that were had never heard or known who the Messiah would be. Of course, when Jesus shows up in Abraham's bosom, in the grave, dead, and just reveals himself, of course they looked at him and said, I want it. <laughs> they were saved. David's child, as well as David, as well as Abraham, as well as Isaac, as well as Jacob, all of them in the Old Testament, looking forward to Jesus, saw Jesus when he came into the grave, and he spoke to them, and they accepted him. That's why David could say, yeah, I'm going to see my child. Of course I am. And he did. He saw him. Period. In the story. Now, is David's child saved? I don't know. I just know that David would have seen his child. Whether the child would have made a decision or whether Jesus would have spared him at that point in time, don't know. That's for God to decide. 
Now, the interesting thing we find, let's just give another scripture for that. The interesting thing we find is that not only did David say he would see his child, because David is obviously the king, and David's child was important, although he was born as under you know questionable circumstances. Jesus comes on the scene. Now, it's kind of interesting at the birth of Jesus because we talk a lot about how Jesus was born in Bethlehem Ephrata, you know, and that he was, you know, seen by the wise men and they came and gave him gold and the angel warned Jesus to, you know, get out of the country and he goes down to Egypt, you know, and he's fair, you know, and so great. We know that story. But do we remember the rest of the story that happened in Israel at the time that Jesus was born? You know, that Herod sent the soldiers out and they slaughtered the innocents? Notice it's called, in the Catholic Church, the slaughtering of the innocents. They even have a feast day for that, kind of acknowledging their death. Now, the prophecy that was given at the birth of Messiah was that Rachel would be weeping for her children, crying and not to be consoled, for they are no more. Think about what I just said, very bluntly, in light of the idea of salvation after death. Rachel, weeping for her children, not to be consoled, for they are no more. Bluntly, what that means is those children slaughtered at the time of Jesus didn't go to heaven. They didn't go into the Sheol. They are no more. And that's what the Bible says. Now you can try to make something out of no more into something. I don't know what. Except for, guess what? They went to hell. Ooh, that's bad. You're telling me all kinds of bad stuff. Can't you tell me some good stuff? Well, yeah, I can. You see. First, I had to tell you why I had a problem with the idea of everybody teaching this wacko idea. Because I could find all these scriptures about why what was being said was false. I could find out very clearly that nowhere was there ever a scripture where it said some little kid went to heaven. I didn't see one. Matter of fact, you can Google it. You'll never find one. You'll never find anywhere it says, oh, like as though David was saying, we're going to heaven. No, he didn't say that. He said, I'm going to see him. So he saw him. We find Rachel not being consoled because they are no more. So we find a contradiction. But there is no contradiction, as you'll see soon as I begin to explain how we can put this all back into God's hands and keep man's hands out of it without making up excuses and recognize God is always, always loving, but he's also always in control and knows better than we do. Remember how we started this? Remember when we first said, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declareth the Lord, you know? That as high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways beyond your finding out. Well, we are also told that if we lack wisdom, we could ask of God, who prayed us not, but give to all men liberally. Now, let me share with you the wisdom of God that he gave me when I was angry about all these aspects of what happens to, quite frankly, aborted children. I mean, let me, let me just make this clear again so we can get down to brass tacks. We're talking about people that honestly think that if they've had 10 abortions, that's almost close to what my sister had, 10 abortions that there's going to be 10 children running around in heaven. No. Let's be clear. An aborted child doesn't go to heaven. There's no, no automatic pass go, no collect 200. Is it still murder? Of course it's still murder. Of course those things are true. But does an aborted fetus automatically go to heaven? No. Remember what I just said. No. We're going to make that clear in a minute. Does a child born, let's just say, oh, I don't know, two weeks old, since that child is two weeks old and is innocent, cute as a little bugger, you know, just rolling around saying, da, da, goo, goo, well, maybe not even saying that. Just rolling around, you know, and is just gorgeous and dies. Automatically goes to heaven. Because that's the angels in heaven, you know, that's God's angels, right? No. It's not what the Bible says. It's not what God said. As a matter of fact, there isn't any scripture that says that. So, no. All babies that are born, besides those that are aborted, all babies that are born do not go to heaven. Now, wait a minute. 
let me clarify that soon, you know, so you don't run off and, you know, say, Michael said no babies. I didn't say no babies. I said it's not true that all babies go to heaven. Moving along. Oh, they're about a year old now, you know. Do all one-year-olds go to heaven? No. Do all two-year-olds go to hell? Well, some people think so. <laughs> Those terrible twos, we know what they're built of. <laughs> they're heading for hell. <laughs> no, but the reality is, is that whether you say an aborted baby, a one-year-old, two-year-old, three-year-old, four-year-old, everybody wants to make a new way of salvation for babies to get to heaven. Kind of like people now are trying to say all dogs go to heaven. Yeah, right, sure. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> They're of the earth? <laughs> Never mind that, but let's get back to the point. Babies are created by God. You get to participate in creation with God. You get to donate the egg. The man gets to donate... Maybe you're the man, but either way. The man gets to donate the sperm. The woman gets to donate the egg. And God gets to donate life. That's the way it works. Whether you believe that or not, you can deal with it. But God breathed into man and he became a living soul. That's what we're told in creation. That's what we're told in Genesis. Every life that is life is breathed into by God. Now, how he does it, that's God's business. Not mine. And just know that is true. Because that's what it says in creation. And he became a living soul. So, three parts. God having already written, and this is where a lot of people try to get the whole idea of somehow they're going to heaven, God already wrote down in the book of life. He has a book, by the way, kind of like a Bible, where before you were born, before I was born, here's a book. Every single living soul, whether in heaven or hell, every single soul ever created is already recorded in the book of life. Some names will be blotted out, and you'll see probably a blot mark, because that's what the Bible says. Now, I don't know how that works. I don't know whether it's a page, a book page with pages that look like these pages, or whether it's some other continuity, how it actually looks, whether it's a scroll, whether it's a book, whether it's... Who knows? God knows. I don't. I know what John recorded in the book of Revelation. I know he saw it. I know he said it. I know he told us. And I know that it's been prophesied. So I do know that there's a book. That's all I know. And it's called the book of life. I do know, based upon John also, that before the foundations of the world, that means before creation ever started, God wrote down every single soul's name. Before the foundations of the world, God already knew the beginning from the end. He already knew what the end of the world would be like, the end of our age, the end of my life, the end of your life, before I was ever born. He even knew how many hairs I had on my head. He even counted them. He wrote down all my members, it says, in his book of life. Now, in his book of life, he has aborted babies. I know I wrote a interesting story when I first got saved about God's torn page, you know, that somehow I... I tried to equate when I first got saved. I think it was within three months of being saved. I wrote a story about how in the lamps, or the, how in God's book of life, there's torn pages, and you know the the story goes about when the angel, you know, presents to God, you know, the torn pages or the book of life. He tries to prevent God from seeing the torn pages, and God opens up the book and says, "Well, wait a minute. What are these torn pages? I didn't tear the pages." And the angel says, "These are abortions." You know, and it was a powerful piece, and it made a lot of people feel guilty and wrong. And, you know, that was at the time that I was trying to make people guilty to not do abortions. And, you know, guilt doesn't work, by the way. And it's not how God would stop somebody from having an abortion. That's not how it works. Sorry. It's the love of God that uh, brought them into repentance. Not some law. Not some guilt. Not some video. Not some way of counseling. It's Jesus Christ. Period. Jesus talking to a person and changing their heart. You don't change a person's actions on the outward. You change it from the inward outward. So, having said that, the book of life, the real one without the torn pages, every single name is written in it. The entire destiny and every single action, every single thought, every single deed, every single word is recorded in that book. 
Do you understand that? Seriously, think about it. Only God could do that because He exists outside of time. So for Him, it's already over with. This is already done. Everything has already been accomplished. That's why Jesus could say it is finished. Then He's going back to heaven. But we don't understand that, but God does. So getting back to as high as the heavens, His thoughts aren't our thoughts, you know, nor is His ways our ways. Our ways are we have to live through this rerun that God has already seen. We have to play out as it were, what God has already determined and organized and coordinated and seen to and planned for and already determined based upon our free choices, yes, on this side of what we think is a free choice, God has already seen what we're going to choose and already planned for that. God already knew our choices before we made them. So he planned for it. Perfect sense. That's why he can be God and why his ways can be bigger than our ways and his ways can be not our ways because we think we're in charge and we're just going along with the plan or going against the plan <laughs> as it may be so as you'll see think about this for a minute did God know Hitler was going to be born well of course he knew before Hitler was ever born before the world began before creation started that Hitler was going to be born to a family and that God would have made every opportunity for Hitler to come to salvation as we're told in the book of Romans he had an opportunity and when he knew God he chose not to accept God but chose to reject God and so God gave him over to his own lust and that he burned in his own mind consumed by his own flesh and doing those things that were improper in the eyes of God and God knowing that Hitler was going to do that used his life as an example of what a antichrist would become or would look like and how he would be accomplished and how he would fulfill prophecy because God after all recorded it all for us so that we would know that he really is in control he really is outside of time and we can prove everything by way of prophecy if it comes true if it doesn't come true throw God out I mean to put bluntly but since everything is coming true exactly the way he said it then he either is looking at life as a rerun and he's already written it down or that's quite a powerful bunch of coincidences. <laughs> so, since God knew Hitler, we just use a bad example, right? Let's use a good example. God knew you. God knew you were going to choose him. God, knowing that you were going to turn your life over to Jesus at some point in time, protected your life from the moment you were born all the way up until the moment that you chose him so you would know that you had his loving protection and hand upon you from all the time that you were not choosing him to the point where you realize that you chose God yes sort of but God chose you and loves you from before you were born and that you would gradually develop this personal loving relationship with God our Father because you realize how loving that was of him to love you so much that he would protect you, guide you, and give you all the freedom of choice to the point where you would finally decide and go along with his plan for your life and that you would come to him in eternity. Sounds wonderful. Cool. What's that got to do with abortion? What's that got to do with babies going to heaven? Well, now let's put it into perspective. God knows a baby's life, right? Yes or no? Well, obviously, yes. God knows if that baby grows up, will that baby choose Jesus or not choose Jesus? Well, I don't know. It didn't grow up. Ah. But in God's plan, where God wrote down every aspect of that baby's life, every nuance of that baby, whether it was allowed to grow up or not allowed to grow up, would God use that for his glory? or for your satisfaction, your personal feelings. You see, I can't tell you that all babies go to heaven, but I can tell you some babies do. Wait a minute, Michael. You mean to tell me that you just argued with me about my child not going to heaven? Now you're going to tell me my child is in heaven? No, I'm not. I'm going to tell you this. God knows where your baby is. If your baby was allowed by grace and mercy of God himself as a loving father to take into heaven, 
because he knew the baby would choose him, then that's how the baby wound up there. You see, there's a difference. God knowing that a baby would choose Jesus still leaves the plan of salvation that God had determined that all would come to God through Jesus Christ still in place. If you go with what David said about, oh, well, you know, I'm going to see my child, so all babies go to heaven, then you wind up with all babies, not some babies, going to heaven. And you eliminated the need for Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. Because God can choose to use that baby's freedom of choice, knowing that it would have been recorded in his book of life before the foundations of the world, that that baby, if it had been grown up fully to the life that it would have lived, then would have chosen Jesus. And so God can take some babies to heaven. That's, quite frankly, spiritual logic. It fits scripture perfectly. It continues to give God the glory, continues to operate inside of God's love and mercy, continues to extend grace where it should be in his hands and not ours. It continues to prove that there's only one way of salvation through Jesus Christ and that through the redemption of the cross that he has purchased for us through the blood that was shed by the Son of God dying for us. It also proves that the remissions of sin can only be shed by the sprinkling of the blood that Jesus has done in heaven on the throne. So, as a lamb that was shed before the foundations of the world, then we know that the opportunity for salvation to a soul that may have perished as a baby may be there. Maybe. But you see, part of the problem of wanting to comfort you is that rabbis could not comfort Rachel weeping for her children because they are no more because the prophecy had said quite bluntly they are no more. So there are some children that don't go to heaven. There are some babies that will not make it into salvation. There are some aborted fetuses that will not be there. Whether there are all not there, I don't know. I can't say that because God can do, quite frankly, just in my own limited mind, what I just said. Because he told me, uh, what can I do? And you know, that's kind of the way he made me learn this process was that he asked me, what can't I do? And I said, Okay, <laughs> you know, I'm like me out. You're like, well, you can't go against your word, but then again, everything in your word could be really kind of like taken different. So if you really had to work it, you know, you really could kind of like. And this is the interesting thing is that people say God can't go against his word, but if I ask Greg Laurie, well, if you tell me that that child is in heaven, how do you explain salvation? And he can't. He can't explain salvation for that child except for God did it. Grace. He can't say that Jesus Christ died for that child. He can't say that because the child didn't know Jesus beforehand. But you can, by way of what I said, understand how that child could meet Jesus in Sheol, you know, and how David could have been there and how that could have happened. But after the fact, now that we're in the New Testament or that we're in past the cross, so let's quit saying New Testament, but that now that we're on the other side of the cross and that death in Hades has been removed and that, you know, we're looking at the lake of fire, you know, and and hell. Sadly, if you wanted to make it look sad, then God spares life by allowing it not to germinate. God, some people would say, if God isn't in control of everything, he's in control of nothing. And some people like to say, well, God just puts into process these things and then stands back and watches from afar and he's not involved in the everyday aspects because the God of this world is in charge. Well, the God of this world is in charge occupying this world just like we're occupying this world and he gets to be in charge of doing things what he wants to do to a certain degree and causing certain things to happen but God allows that by his sovereignty. So, you still have to put back into perspective a miscarriage. Well, what's a miscarriage? Well, bluntly, what was accomplished by the miscarriage? Really, seriously, what was accomplished? God's will was done. You see, everything is done according to God's will, or nothing is done according to God's will. That's how big God is. Now, let's put it into the way you should understand it. 
Because, you see, some people could say, well, that's me. God is you know, God of wrath, and innocent people die, and innocent people go and get killed in tornadoes or floods or car accidents or everything else. No, they don't. How big is your God? I mean, I'm pretty blunt. You know, It's like, well, how big is your God? God said, and I'm pulling out of here now, God said, every single hair on my head is counted. It's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. It's written, well, it's, it's written in the Lamb's Book of Life because I got saved, but it's written in His Book of Life, God's Book of Life. Every detail of my life is written there. Every single aspect of my life is written there. God already knowing all this was going to happen could already have planned this without ever having to even lift a finger. And so, the person who says that innocent people died in some kind of catastrophe is false. God already knew who's innocent who's not. God already knew who's right, wrong, and otherwise. God knew the end from the beginning. He knew what was going to happen. If God is love, then sometimes you might want to look at death as being loving as opposed to being mean because you're going home to be with the Lord. Now, somebody says, well, that, that don't sound right. How could a God of love do this to people, you know, and why do people suffer? What's accomplished? Period. What's accomplished? If you talk to any mature Christian, they say, yeah, I learned more when I was suffering than I learned when I was blessed. <laughs> and I got blessed through my suffering. Yeah. What was accomplished? God's will was done. You see, love can allow these things to happen for a purpose if your God is big enough. And if you don't understand that your God is bigger than the universe, and you can't comprehend how God can make certain aspects of all this work together with what I just said in having all this written down ahead of time and already planned out every single life that lives and ever will live and already has that recorded and already done, then one thing I do agree, that's kind of hard to understand, but remember what I started this with? My thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways, saith the Lord. That's like if he holds the universe in the palm of his hand, which according to Christianity, we say he does. So how big is your God? If he can hold the universe between the forefinger and the palm of his hand that much, then don't you think that his mind is like even bigger than the universe? That his mind and his capabilities are greater than our mind and capabilities to think, to plan, to do? You see, love will cause you to recognize the greatness of God and to be humbled, first of all, by just how much He loves you and shows you before the foundations of the world. Love will cause you to be awe-inspired by how much the Father really loves you to either have taken the child, why you don't know, or cause the child to come home to Him, or cause the child to not come home to Him. Because love would have spared you to see the agony of raising a Hitler or raising a Jesus and watching him die on the cross. Or neither one. Jesus said something interesting in these latter days. And we'll wrap it up. He said, Woe. Yeah, no really. Woe unto you in the latter days. He was speaking to those that were in Jerusalem at the time. But, you know, he could have been in here in Israel or in America or wherever. But he said, Woe unto you that give suck in those days. For better had you cast your child upon stones. Because of the evil that's going to come, they're going to, in the Great Tribulation, literally, take children and strip their flesh. They're going to take children and stamp a mark on them that will cause them to be automatically condemned to hell. They are going to take children and cause those children to want you to take a mark of the beast rather than see your child die. Jesus said, Woe unto you that give suck in those days. Because, quite frankly, you don't want to see your child like that, do you? And neither do I. God our Father is merciful. He warns us he teaches us, He guides us, He provides for us, He allows us the knowledge to know, look, 
if you keep on doing this, you may have children, you know, quite frankly, they wind up in hell. Yeah, I love you, but, you know, if you keep doing this, you know, you may wind up with children that I can't help because they won't let me. Do you really want to see that, knowing that you went to heaven and your child went to hell? There is a mercy that you don't understand. There is a grace that you can't comprehend. There is a love that is so deep that you could not understand at all why God would allow you to lose your child as opposed to have them. For those that wind up with children in heaven, praise the Lord. God bless you. You know why. Because it had nothing to do with David and his child. It had nothing to do with anything except the love of God. But for those that don't wind up with their children in heaven, it's because God loved you enough to spare you having to see what your child would have become and what he would have done to everyone around them for the evil that we live in the times that we are in now. Oh, but I would have... But God already wrote down in his book of life everything that child would have done. God already recorded every possibility God has demonstrated all throughout history how even with Pharaoh, he worked salvation towards Pharaoh until the time that Pharaoh said, no, I'm not going to do it, and God hardened his heart. Every single living soul, not only by the book of Romans, but by everything we're taught in the Old Testament, examples of life, has been given an opportunity for salvation. Has been given an opportunity to know God. And should that soul reject God, we have no business telling someone that their child went to heaven when they rejected God Almighty.